part of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We're your hosts, Maggie and... Nicole. Welcome to our 13th episode and our second Friendsgiving episode this month, where we will be talking about the 2019 film Vita and Virginia. Today, we're very excited to be joined by a special guest. He's a film podcaster and writer and expert on feminism, politics, and screen movies, and also a very dear friend of mine, Ryan C. Showers. Well, hi, Nicole. Um, I'm also a semi-expert. I would, I would, I would tell a normal person that I'm, <laughs> I'm an expert of Virginia Woolf, but I'm slightly intimidated by the podcast. Um, so, but <laughs> I studied Virginia Woolf a lot in school, um, and I'm a huge fan of her work and um, media depictions of her. So, I'm very excited to be talking about this movie today. Well, you definitely are more of an expert on her than either me or Maggie, although, you know, I think we both know a bit about her, but but we haven't studied her as intensely as you as you have. So I'm willing to call you an expert on that on this podcast. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> so first, whenever we have a guest and we'd like to ask them some questions just so that the uh, listeners can get to know them a little bit better. Um, if anyone listening to the podcast also listens to Next Best Picture, the other film podcast that I'm on, they will probably know Ryan from there. But we thought you'd, we'd ask you some questions that, you know, have to do with history and film. And the first one is, what is one topic in history that you are really interested in? Well, I don't want to sound like I'm taking the easy way out here, but feminism, like any type of feminist, any type of feminism in, in terms of like intertwining with history, um, I'm immensely interested in um you know in college i was a women's studies political science communications major um i'm very passionate about um women's representation and um just the historical arcs that um different um women's rights his um the history of women's rights so and that's reflected in my in a lot of my taste awesome i think that also makes you a great fit for this podcast (laughs) yeah like a seriously a perfect fit (laughs) <laughs> I'm I'm an honorary member of the um of the girls tonight. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what are some of your favorite films? Well, um Nicole already mentioned um I love the Scream movies. Um they were the f- um th- they were the films that introduced me to um or at least normalized um strong women characters um at a young age. I started watching the Scream movies whenever I was um, in sixth grade and um, <laughs> from th- they really made an impression on me and my taste as I've grown into a more mature um, a di- a digester of art and film um, mm-hmm. but also I love and I love the hours I-, I would say like Scream is like the movie that has my heart but if I was asked what my favorite movie is in terms of like awards and prestige I would easily say the hours which of course is based on um, Michael Cunningham's uh, book, which is based on Virginia Woolf's book, um, Mrs. Dalloway, where mm-hmm. it tells the story of Mrs. Dalloway in three um, different representations of the character, one of which is Virginia Woolf herself. So again, why um, I'm so interested <laughs> in talking about the film today. <laughs> yes. It is so funny that you brought up Scream because I was thinking of you earlier today because one of my friends who works in film, she does props on movies, just posted that she just finished working on the new scream movie no way oh my god So she did props on it so she's like she says we filmed this entire movie and you know during the pandemic from start to finish and i was like oh my gosh i have to tell ryan you do oh thank you so much for letting me know that's awesome like i'm i'm so excited for the fifth film um i'm nervous I, i was nervous um for a long time because wes craven he directed the first four, and um, mm-hmm. these films are very feminist. Um, like uh, my sister, who she's kind of like a jock athlete, um, but I've kind of taught her about feminism through the, these films mm-hmm. growing up uh, over the years, and it's just been a great experience. Um, 
but I, I have been skeptical ugh, skeptical about the fifth film um, just mm-hmm. because I'm very attached to the original cast. Like the Scream films are, they've had the same cast throughout the first four um, as in the leading roles. And that's, a, that's, uh, that's unheard of in, in the horror genre. So I'm just, I, I don't, I get the sense that they won't be the leads of Scream 5. So that has me nervous, but I'm otherwise excited. So very good. Yeah. Amazing. So then obviously, you know, the hours or at least two thirds of the hours counts as a period drama. But do you have any other favorite period drama films? Who? Okay. Um, Well, uh, not to be totally on brand or brown nosing, but um, my favorite film of 2019 was Little Women. Um, I would be (laughs) remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, I, I am, a I, I, I love films like Revolutionary Road, um, and The Reader, both of which came out in 2008, um, with Kate Winslet. I'm a huge fan of her period, um, period works. Um, I, I, I prefer, a, like, period films that have a darker edge to them, or at least a darker emotional arc, which is why I connect so much with Nicole Kidman's, um, performance in The Hours, when she plays Virginia Woolf. Um, so let me think. Um, and of course I love, um, I don't know if this counts, but I love Shakespeare in Love. That's one of my, um, favorite period films ever. (laughs) Oh, it counts. It counts. One of these days, Maggie and I always say we're going to get around to to talking about that film on the podcast. (laughs) I remember. Because there would be a lot to dissect there. (laughs) Definitely. So much. It's a lot of fun and, um, a lot to analyze, both good and bad, um, you know, and I love Gwyneth Paltrow, um, and that and that film is just enchanting for her. It is a really good film. So, you know, drawing back to today's episode, what made you choose this film for the podcast? What made me choose Vita and Virginia? Yes. Um, I mean, I kind of foisting it upon Ryan, really, but... <laughs> oh, well, I see how it is. It's funny because I am a huge Virginia Woolf fan. I have read most of her books um, and a lot of her essays. Um, and I actually had never seen, I, I was lo- looking forward to this film so much the year it played at the festivals, but it never got a theatrical release in, in that mm-hmm. year. Um, so by the time it was released, it was like, I think in the spring of the following year. So I had kind of missed it and I had it on the back burner for a while. And plus the reviews weren't great. So I, um, I had never actually seen it before. Um, the event of this podcast came about. So um, getting, I just uh, having the opportunity to finally sit down and really, um, you know, take in the film, but also I love talking about Virginia Woolf. I love talking about her work. I love talking about her as such a unique, uniquely weird person in history. Um, You know, somebody, one of my teachers, whenever I was trying to figure out like the waves of feminism in my first um, women's history class in college, uh, she said she described Virginia Woolf as I was like, so is Virginia Woolf like an archetype for first wave feminism? And she's like, well, no, she existed in this era, but she really was her own her own thing. And um, I, I, that's how I describe her to people. I, I, I don't think it can be summed up any better. She was so eccentric and she had such a she she viewed um, she had such an interesting take on feminism and a lot of her feminism at first anyways was in regards to um being anti-war and um a lot of her work is very distinguished from her colleagues at the time or similar um similar authors and writers at the time amazing well i feel like that's a good way to, to sort of segue into the the main bit of the show to, to talking about uh Vita and Virginia um like Ryan said it, it had kind of a weird release it premiered at TIFF in September 2018 it had a a very small release um in the U.S. in August of 2019 uh I certainly don't think we got it anywhere around where I live um it was directed by I hope I'm saying this right but Chanya Button um, and it was written by her and uh, Eileen Atkins, which it's actually based on the play of the same name, which premiered in London in 1993 and then off Broadway in 1994. 
Um, I would be so curious to look at the two scripts side by side. Uh, but the film stars Gemma Arterton, Elizabeth Debicki, and Isabella Rossellini, amongst others. Um, I also thought it's worth noting, I thought this was a very interesting thing about the film, is that uh, Emerald Fennel, I think is how you pronounce it, uh, plays Vanessa Bell in the movie. And she's mm-hmm. actually the writer and director of the film Promising Young Woman, which comes out later this year on Christmas Day. Uh which oh. I thought was pretty cool, like, to see her show up, uh, you know, also doing her her acting thing. Um, and the film is about the romance between Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West in the 1920s, and it sort of tries to um, tell us a bit, I think, about both women as well as their relationship. Uh, moving into sort of our, our thoughts on the film, I also missed this film whenever it first came out, so it was my first time watching it. I had really looked forward to this because I think that Vita and Virginia have a very interesting story, and they're both really fascinating women, and um, after watching the film, and I, I, I think both of you agree with me, they deserve so much better than this movie. Um, I and, and none of that is at the fault of the actors, I think. I actually liked quite both performances both leading performances quite a bit um my issues with the film really lie in the the script and the direction and the score good lord i don't know what they were doing with that score and it's not just that it's a modern score it like just doesn't fit the movie at all um at all like and i know ryan you texted me after (laughs) you watched it and we're like what is that score I, um, 20 minutes in, I was so put off by the score. I mean, I was put off by it at first. I was like, oh my God, what are they doing? But like, it's just completely inappropriate um, for the time period, for the story that they're telling. And I, I'm i trying to be as open-minded with this film as possible because even though it's a film I really looked forward to um, and th- on the surface you would think would be a natural fit for somebody of my taste and background and just general interest. Um, but... I'm such a big fan of The Hours that I, I'm i trying not to compare it to The Hours, but The Hours has this, like, one of the most beautiful scores ever um, ever produced in a film. Um, and I, it, it fits the time period um, so well for Virginia Woolf's section. This modern score, this, like, Trent Reznor, like, David Fincher-esque score that they, uh, that they executed here, I just felt really took away from the film. I agree. I was very confused by what they were trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. It just... It felt like a score for a different movie in a different time period in a different... With different characters. It just... It it felt so wrong. It literally felt like maybe they had just accidentally put the score from a different movie into this movie. Um, Yeah. I, I... You know, I have... A handful of issues with the film the score is one of them one is like this is gonna sound funny but there's just too many men in this movie and like every scene i was like can we just leave the two of them alone um and let them do their thing (laughs) but i like that it tries to like make use of their letters and actually like directly quotes from some of their letters to each other uh the way that they included the letters really didn't work for me and it's not I I was trying to figure out what exactly about it really didn't work because I'm not opposed to the whole, like, uh, someone, you know, reading the letter, looking directly into the camera. I think, you know, you mentioned Little Women earlier, and that's done incredibly well in that movie, but it just really didn't work here. Uh, I did like the production design. I thought some of the houses that we got to see were quite lovely. Oh, yes. Um, Insanely gorgeous. (laughs) The costume design... eh. I liked some of it. I liked some of the pastel looks. I liked Vita's high-waisted pants. I didn't think it fit the film perfectly well. I felt like they were trying to do some things with it that weren't working. And Mm -hmm. I particularly wasn't loving how they costumed Elizabeth Debicki as Virginia Woolf. Um, But, like, it, you know, it wasn't the worst part of the movie. Um, There's a lot of pacing issues in this film. Um, And I do think the last 20 minutes of the movie are by far far the strongest bit of it um and like there's i will say there's one line that i was like "Ooh, yes it's when uh uh virginia says um you have as much of me as i have to give and i was like oh okay so they're like they they are capable of writing something here um but then there were also moments like oh y'all that scene with the birds that scene with the yeah. birds i was like mm-hmm. get me if i had seen that in a movie theater i would have walked out i would have been like get me out of here 
Um, well, and Nicole, I agree with <laughs> everything you've said. Like, and for, I love that you just made a big distinction between the production and the costumes. Um, because mm-hmm. I agree, like the production I thought was gorgeous. I could have looked at it for days. And then like the costumes, not even just on the leads, which I actually thought Vita's looks were kind of better um, than Virginia's. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I have a lot of issues with the way that they the way that they portrayed um, the way that, the, the way that they visualized Virginia compared to how they how she's been visualized in the past. Um, but. I, I didn't like the costumes and especially the costumes on the supporting characters like Virginia's sister, Vanessa, um, Leonard Wolf, you know, um, Virginia's husband. I thought I, I, there were I thought those characterizations were just off in general, but from the actors, from the writing to the costumes and the direction. Um, but the costumes just felt like they were just thrown together out of somebody's closet. Like um, I, I, <laughs> I, I agree with everything you said there, Nicole. I know that's yeah. basically like my own summation of the film is everything Nicole said is how I feel too. <laughs> um, one of the things that like at first I was worried that it was just like me and like I was having an off day when I was watching it because I really struggled to find like things that I liked, like really liked about the film. I can usually find some positive, um, but I really just came away from this like, eh. It, it was okay. I mean, I adore Gemma and I adore Elizabeth, but I spent the entire time thinking about how they were themselves mm-hmm. and I couldn't see Virginia or Vita. And like Elizabeth is gorgeous and wonderful, but she's not who I envision as Virginia Woolf at all. And I don't know. I don't usually have an issue with like seeing the actors through the role. And like, I really had a really hard time like connecting with their what the script was giving them to work with. Because I don't think it was the actor's fault. I truly think it was in part what they were working with and maybe even the directing just didn't create these, these characters that were really memorable. Um, And like you said, Nicole, the costumes were gorgeous and I'm going to talk about them more later on, but uh, you know, there was some really weird choices made in this film from some of the costume choices to some of the pacing choices to the, the birds, which I'm still, still trying to figure out on my own. I figured they had something to do with like mental health or maybe somebody really liked Hitchcock. Um, <laughs> I just, it was an interesting, um, very art house like choice. Well, you know, I, I don't like it's, I, I'm, I'm glad that you said this Maggie because I I didn't I feel like as Elizabeth Debicki, um, she just you know came out of her makeup trailer. She went into her makeup trailer mm-hmm. as Elizabeth Debicki, and she came out as Elizabeth Elizabeth Debicki. Um, like you know, there's a reason yeah. why Denzel Washington, when Nicole Kidman won the Oscar for playing Virginia Woolf, why he said by a nose Nicole Kidman. Like the the hours went out of its way to um, really make Virginia Woolf's distinctive appearance come through. Um, and I feel like here, even even if the hours went too far in making her um, disappear into the character, this film doesn't do it enough. Um, and that was a huge problem for me on a performance. Uh, it, so it was hard for me to almost appreciate what Elizabeth Debicki was doing because I, I didn't feel like I was watching Virginia Woolf. Um, and, I, mm-hmm. and I actually don't really like the way that the film um, portrays Virginia Woolf. Um, I don't think that they get her personality quite quite correctly. Um, she was a, a complex person and she had a very um, lively sense of humor. And Elizabeth Debicki's performance does not capture that at all. She plays her as someone who's more deranged than, um, it, which is kind of very shallow, a very shallow interpretation of Virginia Woolf, mm-hmm. I would argue. Whenever Virginia Woolf was known for being, I wouldn't say gregarious, but she had a weird, uh, like a very, um, uh, a very malleable sense of humor um and yes. it, that was lost and there were and like totally lost and uh, i i don't i don't know that's i i just feel like they they missed they they missed a huge opportunity to really bring a three dimensional version of this um hugely important author in history to life i agree 100% and then, so you're going to tell us a little bit more about Virginia Woolf. So this would be like the perfect segue into yeah. our first topic for today's episode. Uh, 
what and okay so virginia wolf i've already um referenced uh, mrs dalloway which is um mm-hmm. probably her most famous work um you know one one of the things that i really disliked about this movie is the way that they um they referenced her works it's like oh I just finished writing Mrs. Dalloway. It's going to the printer right now. Like, do you know a huge theme in Mrs. Dalloway is um, lesbianism, bisexuality. And for the life of me, I can't believe that they would skirt over Mrs. Dalloway. And they they reference Virginia, like their completed work, but they don't like, there was such a, a missed opportunity to link up Vita, Vita and Virginia's relationship with some of the content or substance of that book. Um, it just, yes. uh, and they, they, they did it with To the Lighthouse too, um, where they was, uh, where she was writing, oh, what are you writing? Oh, I'm To the Lighthouse. It's almost finished. It's brilliant. And then we never hear about it again. I thought that was such an amateurish move um, and like a, a weird way of just like, <sighs> of, of checking a box. Like, oh, we did this. We, <laughs> We 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 referenced her her most famous books. Woohoo! I, I didn't think I think that there could have been some more depth there. That really bothered me. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Because or is that just me nitpicking? No, I agree. I thought the way that they discussed publishing and they discussed printing as a whole in this film was very flawed. It seemed like a secondary point to all of these characters who are known for you know writing and creating these worlds and there was such an opportunity like you said to connect those themes in a book like mrs dalloway to what was going on in the plot of the movie and it just got glossed over entirely it felt kind of like you know did y'all ever have to write like little skits in school about a historical (laughs) figure or something yes you've got like your checklist of things that you need to mention and you're like ah I have just finished writing Mrs. Dalloway. It is going to the printer. Like, that's kind of how it came yes. off at times. <laughs> and it's just, it, it kind of just, like, it makes my blood boil a little bit because because of the fact that Mrs. Dalloway, and Mrs. Dalloway is so famous for its approach with um, gender issues and um, sexuality issues that they that mm-hmm. they couldn't make that that link for a story about Virginia Woolf's relationship her most one of her most prominently known relationships with another woman um it, it frustrated me um on on that level i um and i also i don't think that they i the film really it was hard for me to break through with this film at first because it felt like it felt very repetitive for the first hour in my opinion i felt like yes. vita was so um persistent with virginia um, and Virginia was just pushing her away. And then some and then somehow it just it just switches where it's the the roles or the roles reverse. And then it becomes more interesting because um, I think Virginia is a more compelling person. I think she's a more um, a, a more detailed analytical person um, than than Vita was. So whenever the mm-hmm. perspective shift and we get that like the last 30 minutes where she's writing um, she's writing the book um, and the, they're still playing this game I, that 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 stuff was so compelling. Um, but the first uh, the, the first hour I felt was I feel like we could have the script could have been even more concise um, mm-hmm. than even I and I know that sounds hypocritical because I was just saying, well, they were being, you know, that they should have exp- expanded more on some things, but I felt as though um, the plot, um, the plot device was y- repeatedly used too much. I was wondering, I was also wondering, Ryan, what you thought, because I know that I'm sure you have thoughts on this, um, and what you could tell us from, you know, what you have learned about her, um, about their depiction of Virginia Woolf's mental health. <sighs> <sighs> it it seemed like it was just on my like opinion of this it felt like it was written by somebody who had only ever like heard about mental illness secondhand mm-hmm. it was so oddly yep. framed well not only that but i just feel as though they didn't approach it one with a huge amount of intimacy on one level mm-hmm. but then also i i i didn't i felt like it was a very um shallow interpretation of mental illness 
which kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier um, about like Virginia's sense of humor. Like they, pl- I felt like they contrived Virginia as uh, as just this. Like I, I felt like this movie wasn't well researched enough on who Virginia Woolf was and mental illness and Virginia Woolf and men- mental illness her and her specific. Uh, mental illness combined you know what i mean i felt like there was a lot of um a lot of depth that they missed and it comes off not uh, not as a caricature but it comes off very uh it comes off very shallowly i wasn't it's gonna impressed sound funny but there were times where i almost felt like <laughs> the film made virginia into some weird like manic pixie dream girl for vita um, yes yeah especially in like I mean, I'm not super well versed on Virginia Woolf's like specific mental health issues, but um, clearly they weren't either, because <laughs> like the scenes that dealt with it, I was like, I can't decide if they think that if they're just going for like, and I hate to use this word, this is not something I would use, you know, to, to talk about people who are mentally ill, but it felt like they were like, ooh, she's crazy. Yep. Um, and that was kind of all that they ever did. They were like, she's crazy and she's sad, and that's it. That's that's mental health. There was and no was nuance. Like, there was no nuance to the mental illness, which is shocking given that this was made now. Last year. <laughs> like, it came out last year. I would expect this from a film from, like, the 70s. <laughs> right. No, they just – they made her seem as though she was just this, like, um, manic, like um, – you know, prodigy, but like, I think that they they were on the right track with her melancholy, um, mm-hmm. sadness, but they uh, they didn't couple it with the more dynamic parts of her personality and how her um her 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 attempts at suicide, her struggles with um where she lived and how she interacted with her surroundings. Um, I, they didn't, uh, they didn't intersect that or just like how I said before, she had, she was a very clever person. Like she was very funny and that she was, like, th- that was not in the film. The film does not portray her as a human being. They portray her as a very flat quote, crazy quote person as Nicole said, like not, and it, it's almost lacking in respect. Mm-hmm. Tremendously so. Yep. Um, well, I feel like I uh, I don't want to say that we've exhausted the topic because we could honestly talk for days about the ways in which this film gets Virginia Woolf wrong. But Maggie, I know that you did some research in the Bloomsbury set, which is one of these topics that uh, is briefly mentioned and kind of hinted at, mm-hmm. but they never actually get into. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I feel like I... <laughs> I'm also a little like curmudgeonly about the Bloomsbury set. So I'm very sorry for anyone listening to this who might ironically like the Bloomsbury set. <laughs> um, so they were only mentioned really in passing in the film. Um, they existed during the first half of the 20th century. Um, it was a group of English writers, intellectuals, philosophers, and artists. Um, Essentially, they were extremely privileged people who saw themselves as bohemian free spirits, and they dabbled in the arts, um, but in no way did any of them really rely on that for gainful employment. It was really just like a hobby. Um, They began meeting at the London home of Virginia's sister, Vanessa Bell, and the group first got its name for the, the Bloomsbury set. Um, after Vanessa and several of the other members put up an exhibition called the Second Post-Impressionist Exhibition, and that was in 1912. Um, And most of them actually lived in the garden district of um, the Bloomsbury, like, garden area in London, um, which is where the name came from. They were all wealthy. Um, Some of them were more middle-upper class Um, as well, but they were also politically liberal, sexually liberal. Um, There was lots of rumors about affairs amongst themselves. Um, It was, you know, it was a bunch of rich people having fun. And they would meet a couple days a week, and they had different 
like Friday was for art. So all of the artists would convene and it was, I mean, rich people doing rich people things. Um, (laughs) um, There were 10 core members and then there were an additional 13 supposed and rumored members. Um, I wrote up a list of all of the members of the core group. Um, Of course, Clive Bell, who was an art critic. Um, Vanessa Bell, who was a post-impressionist painter. Leonard Wolf, um, essayist and nonfiction writer. Virginia Wolf, of course, a fiction writer and essayist. Uh, E.M. Forster, also a fiction writer. Um, Roger Fry, who was also an art critic and post-impressionist painter. Um, Duncan Grant, who was a post-impressionist painter um, and a member of the Camden Town Group. Um, John Maynard Keynes was an economist. Desmond McCarthy was a literary journalist. Uh, Leighton Strachey was a biographer. So as you can see, you know, a very certain type of people were drawn into this little group of friends. And, you know, this idea isn't um, uncommon. I mean, even still today, we have groups of people who meet to go over their works of art and their works of literature and critique one another and, you know, have this little like group. But this just, when I was reading some of the letters from members of the group and from, you know, commentary throughout London about their various exploits, um, I just didn't get a good feeling from them. And I couldn't tell if it was because I had just finished watching the film and I was very disgruntled about the film, but I just was not impressed. (laughs) Yeah. In in terms of their bouginess? Yes. (laughs) Well, they just had, I liked like some of their ideas, but I don't know if it's just like 2020 is getting to me and rich people doing (laughs) this. I'm a free spirit and I want to live like I'm a poor person to really get in touch with my art. It doesn't read well. (laughs) Well, and I I have to, I, so, and like the thing is like there, there was like a a line of like hippiness that like this Mm -hmm. group um, like colored in. And um, that was very much a part of Virginia Woolf's, um, like as I've been referencing her sense of humor um, yes. Her personality. Her personality was very much informed by this group and um, by oh, yes. the friendships here um, and the relationships. And it's informed in her work um, very much so. Mm-hmm. And a lot of her characters and the plots that she's written. Um, I will say, I will I will give you, um, I will take your your side here. I, even like Virginia <laughs> Woolf's, um, her, one of her, her most famous works ever is called A Room of One's Own. And even mm-hmm. when I read that and I wrote about it in 2015, first of all, it's a brilliant piece, and I, uh, I, I, I love it. Um, but there is something like that come that rubs you the wrong way when you think about like um, somebody like Virginia who had the privilege of having her own room to write in, you know, and her, enough food in her belly to be productive, and you know, a, a shelter and a like that she would have the the foresight or the privilege to have all these things, but then to kind of write about it and say, in a way, this is the only way that you can be successful. It's it kind of, yes. in a way it, it, she's right, but in a way it does, it, it does rub you the, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, 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 a Nikki way. It's, it was very strange. And I tried, like, I kind of like walked away from my research and then like came back to it just to see if like I was being grumpy. And I was like, no, it's, it's very weird. And I mean, we see this like throughout history of these very privileged people being like, I'm going to live like a commoner so I can really feel, I mean, Nicole and I talked about this during our Marie Antoinette episode <laughs> where she had her little, you know, adventure as a peasant. And it's, it's very strange to me and I don't, I don't understand it. <laughs> It feels a little bit, uh, it's it's the thing that always, like, rubs me the wrong way about the musical Rent, whenever you've got these, you know, this group of characters who are, like, actually going through it, and then you've got these white boys who have, like, decided that they want to be hippies, and so they're mm-hmm. they're not calling their parents back. Um, but yeah, I, I know what you mean, Maggie, and I think it's interesting, too, to look at, you know, if you look at a work like Mrs. Dalloway, and the kind of people, I don't want to say that it's, I don't want to call it a satire, but I do think there's a... a a level of self-awareness and a level of um, 
it, it it knows what it's saying about the people that it's bragging about. And then you look at this group of people and it's kind of like, okay, Virginia saw you all for what you were. I, I don't, I think in her writing that is clear that I, I, I don't know. I think that um, some of her work seems to, to I don't want to say make fun of this sort of person, but I... It definitely I, I does, maybe, Nicole. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think it, I think satirize is maybe the right word. Um, poke fun at um, this sort of person, and I think that's really interesting that she is in this group, but she's also able to sort of look at them and recognize some of their flaws. Well, and you know, Mrs. Dalloway, um, as as a as a book, it's it has two um, parallel storylines. One about Mrs. about the character of Clarissa Dalloway and her reflecting on her life and her decisions and um her playing this party uh, uh, you know and the other storyline is about a soldier a soldier um coming back from World War 1 and he has mm-hmm. a shell shock so i and again you know Virginia Woolf's i would say her primary public issue um was about was her stance on the war on on war in general um so mm-hmm. I think she was very self aware of the that social um that that social click that you're talking about, Nicole. But also, you know, I, I think the way that she contrasts it with the with the the study of shell shock, um, in Mrs. Dalloway is very poignant. And to your point, it I she is I think she is self aware and making a grand statement about the bourgeoisie. Absolutely. Um, I feel like that's <laughs> that's a good time to s- segue into talking about Vita. Oh, Vita Sackville West. So I've prepared a little bit of a biography on her because I do think that people listening to this are likely to be less aware of who she is. Uh, it's very interesting to see that the film does point out the fact that Vita was significantly more successful in the time that they were together, um, both critically and commercially, than Virginia was. And yet... Today, it's Virginia's, you know, books that we read and that we are assigned in college classes and stuff and not Vita's. Um, And I think that she has in some ways been forgotten, Um, you know, or or she's become a footnote in Virginia's story, which I think is interesting. But she was born uh, Victoria Mary Sackville West in Kent, England in 1892. She was the daughter of the third Baron Sackville, and she was the granddaughter of a Spanish dancer. Uh... She, of course, grows up to become a novelist and a poet, and she marries Harold Nicholson, who's an author himself, actually, and a diplomat after she's courted by several men, and she has a handful of affairs with both men and women. Um, Both Harold and Vita had same-sex relationships outside of their marriage. I think that the depiction of Harold in the film is is a little bit off. Um, He was also a writer. He also was having uh, these relationships outside of their marriage. I think that they maybe portray him as a little bit more, um, how do I say this? A little bit more traditional than he actually was. Um, she did run away with her lover, Violet Keppel, in 1917 and caused quite the scandal. Um, but that actually was a thing that happened repeatedly that wasn't, like, the one and done that the film would, I think, want us to believe. Like, that they kind of just kept running away together and their families kept coming being like, no, please come home. Um, and they would and then they'd do it again. <laughs> Uh, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, Vita was the mother to two sons who she seemingly had a very good relationship with, despite, you know, her, her, uh, busyness otherwise. Um, and she was frustrated her entire life, which they do actually touch on in the film. And I think it's one of the few things that they, they get pretty right. She was very frustrated that she couldn't inherit her family's estate, Noel, which she was very attached to, to the point that she was actually very upset upon her marriage at having to leave the family estate. Um, and she couldn't inherit it because of, uh, her gender because it was willed away to, to a male line. And so I think it, it was inherited by a cousin. Um, uh, but I thought that was that was an interesting thing. Her her best known novels are The Edwardians and All Passion Spent, neither of which I had ever heard of. Uh, no. <laughs> yep. I was like, I don't know if either of y'all know those. I had never heard the names before. Um, she also wrote gardening books and biographies. Um, and as in the film, she was the inspiration for Virginia Woolf's novel Orlando. Uh, Vita was 10 years younger than Virginia, actually. And was very glamorous and very successful. Um, and 
I thought that that was an interesting thing. I don't think that it reads in the film as her being significantly younger than Virginia. Um, the relationship lasted around 10 years from 1925 to 1935, sort of off and on. Um, and the years in which they were together were largely believed to be sort of the artistic peak of both women's careers. Um, I also thought it was interesting, Vita publishing her books through Virginia and uh, Leonard's publishing company really helped them out financially um, because, as I said, Vita was actually quite successful. Um, and so that sort of helped them financially be able to continue doing uh, what else they were doing. Um, and Vita died in 1962. Uh, at the age of 70 from abdominal cancer, she went on to continue having affairs after Virginia. Um, and I think was a really interesting woman in, in, uh, how freely she was able to live. I think it's, it's interesting. I didn't, you know, prepare a lot of research on this, but there were laws in England at the time about homosexuality, um, prohibiting, um, male relationships but basically they forgot to write into a lot of these laws that uh women could also have same-sex relationships and so a lot of women were able to sort of skirt these laws and be more open in their affairs because these laws weren't seen as applying to them um which i think is kind of hilarious uh whenever you think about it that <laughs> men did not even consider <laughs> That women might not be interested in men. Men men being interested in other men was a thing that they could understand, but not women being interested in other women. Um, but that's part of how, like, Vita was able to be fairly open about her bisexuality um, at the time. Which I just think is really fascinating because I think whenever you typically think of people, you know, who were born in the 1890s, you wouldn't think that they could be so openly out. Um, and it's part of, I think, Virginia Woolf's story that I think people even are sometimes, um, I don't want to say they want to ignore it, but I do think that, uh, it doesn't always get talked about with Virginia Woolf, um, or it's kind of hinted at. Uh, so I just thought that that was really interesting. She's, she's an interesting figure and I'm not positive that this film actually did her justice. Well, can I ask, because I don't know nearly as much about her um, as I do Virginia. Was she mm -hmm. as gregarious as the film portrayed her? It seems like it. She was, um, she was said to be very glamorous and she was very popular amongst uh, different groups of people. Um, I think it's interesting that she was sort of able to flip between uh, doing the whole diplomat's wife thing and being an author and being sort of involved in more creative circles. Uh, but I think she definitely was, uh, from what I could find, quite outgoing. Um, although she did at times get quite exhausted whenever she was sort of playing diplomat's wife. There was a time that she did live in um, Constantinople and she eventually went home because she sort of was getting exhausted from the stress of doing all of the the sort of dinners and the parties and the whatever that she's exposed expected to sort of play proper wife at um mm -hmm. and i mean of course that that's what said or did she just want to go home who knows um but i do think that she was probably um more outgoing than someone uh like virginia and it does seem like she pursued her Maybe not as intensely as, as in the film. And I also think that uh, the age difference that they actually had where Vita was, you know, 10 years younger than Virginia um, maybe puts a slightly different dynamic on it. Um, but she certainly thought that Virginia Woolf was a genius and was determined that she would know her. See, Nicole, that would be so interesting to see in the film because, like, this is, um, you know, Virginia Woolf's relatives who have seen this film have criticized it for several different um, reasons, but one of which is the age, the ages of the mm -hmm. actresses cast and how it's not true to life. I would have been so interested to see the way that um, a film would portray this relationship where a younger woman was pursuing an older, a slightly older woman uh, be with because she's a genius. Like, that to me is interesting. And honestly, it makes so much more sense the way that you just described it than how we see it in the film. Um, because it doesn't come across as like, you know, I'm somebody younger and I'm more attracted to older uh, older, uh, older men. So I can, uh, I, I, to me, I think seeing somebody 
younger going after Virginia Woolf because she's a genius and wanting to um, understand her be be a part of her life that would have been that would have made so much more logical and narrative sense and it doesn't come across in the film it just comes across as like the genius element is still there but there's it, it feels incomplete the motivation to me i agree and i think that it is interesting because they try to show you in the film but it almost feels like in the film that vita wants to know virginia because oh she's a genius and like Almost, I don't want to say that it makes her seem like it's a status thing or something. Like, oh, I'm friends with a genius. Um, but I do think that... It felt that way in the film, though. Okay, yeah, right. Like, I, I was like, am I the only one who got that? And I don't think that's what it was. I think that, you know, Vita knew that Virginia was more gifted than she was. And rather than being... I Like, I think it actually says something quite nice about Vita. That rather than being threatened by that or being jealous, yeah. she just wanted to know Virginia she wanted to be involved in her world and she wanted to see if you know she could learn anything from Virginia and uh she knew that she would never be the writer that Virginia was but she also knew that she was more financially successful with her writing and you know the choice to publish her her books through Virginia and Leonard's publishing company I think is a really interesting one in that um she saw this thing that she could do because she wasn't she knew that she you know wasn't as gifted as Virginia was, but she also knew that she was popular um, amongst readers. And I, I don't know, I just think that their story is so much more interesting than what we see on film. And I think Vita in particular, I, I mean, Virginia too, but we have other good depictions of Virginia Woolf um, yeah. in film, like in the hours. And I don't think that we've ever gotten a proper depiction of Vita Sackville West. I mean, the fact that she's known as Vita Sackville West and not Vita Nicholson, I think is interesting. Um, you know, that she is known by her maiden name and not her married name, but I don't know. I, after like, researching a bit more about Vita because I think I, I certainly I and I would assume both of y'all were the same way I didn't know much about her before watching the movie um made me no. really wish that one day we could get like a proper biopic on her because I would I would love to see her depicted on screen I would love to see her relationship with Virginia depicted on screen in a more accurate and thus more interesting way I agree, I agree. wholeheartedly <laughs> <laughs> um no and i this was more of an introduction um to me for her um mm -hmm. i the i only knew an, uh, enough about her um that was connected to virginia wolf and their relationship and i do think that the film was kind of stuck uh, between a rock and a hard place i feel like they had to use the letters um as a primary source because the, the, they're such a big deal um in history um in amongst feminist circles and um, so if they didn't use the letters, it would have been a missed opportunity. But I don't think the film knew how to weave it, weave the letter readings in like, the scenes where they read the letters directly into the camera. I don't think that they knew how to properly form the storyline around them. I agree. And like, this is like a weird nitpicky thing, but I don't know if this is a, a strange thing to say, but I wanted more visuals of the letters. Like I felt like they could have used the letters better to show a passage of time. Um, you know, like, show me letters piling up. Show me, you know, is Vita sending more of them? Like, I felt like they could have done more with that. And especially, like, I felt like I couldn't get a good grasp on the timeline of this movie. Um, especially knowing that they were involved for, like, ten years. Um, I, the, I felt like the actions of the movie took place in, you know, maybe a year. And I have no idea if they were meaning for that to be true or not. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. <laughs> well, Maggie, I know that you've done some research, as you always do, on the costuming. And I would love to hear what you found because the co I have such weird feelings on the costumes in this movie. Me too. So do I. So do <laughs> I. Um, so the costume designer for Vita and Virginia was Lorda Marie Muggan, uh, who is best known for her work on Peaky Blinders. Blinders. Well, I say that wrong every single time. So I'm going to repeat myself. The costume designer for Vita in Virginia was Lorna Marie Muggan, who is best known for her work on Peaky Blinders and Ripper Street. 
Um, I personally find the 1920s to be an extremely easy era to costume simply because the body of knowledge on that time period is massive. Um, you have so much art, so much photography, and so many existing garments to work with. Um, so it really is no surprise that this film did fairly well um, for the period. Um, the only costume I disliked in the film was the magenta leopard print <laughs> ensemble that Vita wore. Um, now, leopard print was around in the 1920s. Um, they love their bold prints and they love their bold colors. Um, I found an article about somebody in the 1920s who not only wore leopard print, but also owned a leopard um, just to put into... Um, into your minds, this this image, um, but it just felt it felt like a very bold choice that made her stand out in an awkward way um, in that particular scene. Um, a lot of the costume blogs pointed out exactly what I was feeling about this movie. The costumes were historically accurate, but they paired them in a way to try to make statements about the characters with the clothes because the plot failed to address it on its own. Um, mm -hmm. So whether than showing us that Vita and Virginia had these very specific personalities, they tried to use the costumes to show that, and that just felt very forced, in my opinion. Um, and some of that is really seen with Vita's clothes. Um, the constant, like, weird combinations of patterns when she was wearing the, like, the pants and the jackets. Just trying way too hard where you could have done a lot with the actual plot surrounding that character. Um, I did find an interview with Lorna where she talked about um, Vita's first costume being her favorite. Um, the quote said, my favorite design for Vita is the black and white silk shirt with the ruffle collar and the cream palazzo pants. This is her interpretation of a tuxedo. It's elegant, sensuous, and quirkily androgynous, um, which does seem very um, fitting for Vita's character. Um, I also found that Virginia Woolf um, was a bit of a fashion icon in real life, um, yet the film really downplayed her fashion sense, um, opting for more drab, neutral tones, um, a lot of darker colors, um, which the costume designer said was an intentional choice for Virginia, um, which kind of felt at odds um, opposite Vita's very bright, wildly patterned pieces. Um, Virginia in real life um, really enjoyed bold floral patterns, um, big hats. She favored pinstripes, none of which were employed in this film. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting choice when you have this real life character that you can very easily find information about their fashion sense and their personal preferences um, to do something opposite of that in the film. It was a very unique choice. Um, overall, I mean, if I was giving these costumes like a one out of 10 scale, I would say they probably fall somewhere around like a seven and a half. Like overall, good. Some choices that I didn't agree with. Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Maggie, in that like they're actually decently period accurate costumes. Mm -hmm. uh, they just don't do well in terms of character building. Um and, and they don't feel accurate to the people who are supposed to be wearing them. They just miss the mark, like, entirely. Yeah, I agree. And this was, like, another point where I was like, am I just being overly judgmental? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I think that there was something missing from, for me personally, um, there was something missing from the aesthetic that didn't, um, that didn't wow me. Mm -hmm. in, I, in the same way I, no, go ahead go ahead no go no, ahead i was just gonna say there was just like whenever whenever you watch this film like i for me the production like i was i i do a double take like wow you know it's striking um i didn't have that reaction with the costumes where there wasn't like a huge like like, like you said they're not inaccurate but they're just they're very lackluster mm-hmm my mom and I always have the saying that you can make a bad show good if you have good costumes. So it was just interesting that like both missed the mark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they both had such potential for being good, both the plot and the costumes, but paired together, it felt like 
at points that the plot was leaning on the wow of costumes to like make you forget what was going on and then at other points the costumes were hoping that the plot would pick up where they were missing and i feel so bad to say that because like both were okay it was just subpar (laughs) definitely i think honestly like that's sort of how i would sum up this film in general it's not like the worst film i've ever seen like i'm not trying to say that (laughs) this is not the great great wall wall. (laughs) yep (laughs) You know what? It wins points. Matt Damon's not in it. Um, so thank God we didn't have that. Uh, oh my God. Now I'm imagining like Matt Damon as like Leonard Wolf or something. Hey, uh, I just want to let you know, while we're talking about Matt Damon for a second, the cinematographer on this film oh God. worked worked on the Born Ultimatum, uncredited <laughs> as a second AC. Just wanted to let you know. Maggie can always find a link between whatever film we talk about and Matt Damon just to make me mad. And I, <laughs> I truly thought her. I wasn't going to make it this time. I went through every single actor nobody had worked with, Matt Damon, none of like the costume department had. And then I was like, what about the cinematographer? He also worked on Wonder Woman, so I mean, like, I have oh a weird God, connection amazing. there, too, so... Well, Maggie, well, are you, were you a history person in college, a history major? I was, yes. I have a degree in historic preservation, and I'm working on my graduate degree in anthropology. Well, you're very well researched, and I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's, uh, I feel like that's the thing about history people is, you know, we have all these research skills that we learned for good purposes, but um, then we, we put them to use for, for other things. <laughs> yeah. So... I feel like, you know, just to, to wrap up, my final thoughts on the movie are just um, Vita and Virginia, as, like, the actual people, deserved better. And two, if you'd like to see a period drama in which Gemma Archerton plays a lesbian, I would urge everyone to check out Summerland, which came out earlier this year. It's uh, as of this week, now on DVD and Blu-ray as well. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, and it's much better than anything in this film. Maggie. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Any final thoughts from you on Vita and Virginia before we wrap this up? Um, I mean, watch it if you haven't. It's on Hulu. Um, you know, it's a movie. <laughs> a, a ringing endorsement. It's a movie. There there are better Virginia Wolf movies out there. That's what I can say. Yeah, honestly, I feel like watching this movie is like, so uh, anyways, stand the hours for clear scan. (laughs) Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. Ryan, your final thoughts on this? Well, I I would like to end on on a positive note. I will say I was about to like abandon the movie not abandon like as in stop watching abandon as in terms of like stop giving a chance to (laughs) give up Um, (laughs) around like the one hour mark. I was like, so no, I I was so fed up. I was like, oh, my God. Um, But I will say once um, once Virginia's perspective becomes more apparent and she um, begins to write Orlando, I did feel the velocity really kick into high gear with the plot. And I thought like it was, there was a very compelling arc to the film um, where, you know, once it gets going, it is, it is very interesting. And it did um, take my overall grade up um, a, 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 a number or two. Um, I, I think that they, I, it could have, it could have been better with build up and um, a different overall characterization of Virginia. But I thought that the last 30 minutes that we got were at least worthy on several levels so um for all the problems that i have with the film it is um it would be worth watching just to see that final progression with the two characters Mm -hmm. even if it's not accurate or if it's if it it could have been better um overall um characterization of their relationship which i do hope i don't mean to be so shady but i do hope that we someday get a better film or miniseries about Vita and Virginia and their relationship because it is so interesting and um and I think the, this film shows the potential um of the relationship without you know giving us you know without acting on that potential if that makes sense so I completely agree um and I do think like you said it is worth watching uh but I would say watch it and then also watch the hours if you've not seen that and also you know do a little bit of your own research on both Vita and Virginia, because they are fascinating women. Um, And I think there's a lot, a lot to learn about them. I honestly am personally considering uh, looking into seeing if I can 
get my hands on some of their letters to read. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to our 13th episode of Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies, and a huge thank you to Ryan for guesting on this episode. Well, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate you guys just listening to me rant and go off on tangents about (laughs) this obscure, curious, mercurial woman from, you know, a hundred years ago. So, (laughs) yes. And make sure to tune in next month for some very special holiday themed content here on Petticoats and Poppies. You can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Maggie at Maggie of the Town. And you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16. Ryan, where can they find you on social media and where can they read your work about film? Okay. Well, um, I'm very active on Twitter. Um, My Twitter handle is RCS818. Um, And you can read my... um, my uh, um, my writing about film um which i designate a lot of my pieces um to um feminist takes on um, movies and the awards race um i write for next best picture next next best picture.com and um i'm often on the podcast you can listen to our podcast on spotify apple podcast or on the airglue media website and we're now on audible If you like what you hear, don't forget to leave us a rating on Apple Podcast or over on Podchaser if you're on Android. Every few episodes, we will be reading our reviews, so be sure to leave us one if you would like to be featured. We'll be back soon with another exciting episode as we continue to look at period films from a history and film perspective. Until then, stay safe and healthy. You've been listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. This is not not the the Great Great Wall. Wall. (laughs)